Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. Is the AI fed over? Is the hype fading? Is that what I'm feeling? Hold on. Am I am I not supposed to be talking about self-driving cars anymore? Am I a loser? What's next? What's the new thing going to be? Is it going to be the metaverse? No, it's not going to be the metaverse. Get out of here. Or or is it? Is it going to be web 3? What is that even? Are we just making up words now? Is that how this is going to go? What are the kids going to be into next year? What's going to be cool? What's going to be hip? What's going to get me paid? Speaking of making money, what's work going to be like? Do you think we're going to go even deeper into this work from home thing? Do you think the new trend will be people posting photos of how tricked out and wonderful their home office is, including loads of new products and gizmos? What's the new wave of consumer electronics going to be about? Are wearables finally going to take off in a whole new way? No, it's going to be about haptics. I heard some guy say haptics the other day. I have no idea what that is. The truth is, no one knows. But you can make a lot of money if you can predict trends like these, if you get ahead of the curve. You can also lose a lot of money if your business makes the wrong bet. The future promises great riches, but also great risks. Maybe it's not surprising then that there's a whole industry dedicated to consulting businesses about the future. In this episode, I chat with Devin Powers, a professor of advertising, media, and communication at Temple University, about her book, On Trend, The Business of Forecasting the Future. Power's book examines the world of futurists, cool hunters, and forecasters who sell people advice about tomorrow. We talk about how we should think about the influence of such individuals, given that their predictions are often misleading and inaccurate. And we also discuss how the making of futures can become more just and inclusive. I had a lot of fun talking with Devin. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Get excited. Devin, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I liked on on trend a lot. Uh, when you tell strangers about it, what do you tell them it's about, and what were you trying to do with it? Oh, strangers! Am I talking to just like lay people or just? Yeah, like... that's who I that's who I want to talk to about stuff. So yeah, the layman. Yeah, I tell them I wrote a book about the future, and they inevitably say, "What? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, how do you write a book about the future?" And then I get to explain a little bit about what I really want to talk about, which is trends and futures methods and things like that. Um, Your book begins by talking about a firm called Sparks and Honey, which I I looked at the last couple of days. It describes itself on its web page as a cultural intelligence consultancy. So what is Sparks and Honey and what does it do? Yeah, so Sparks and Honey is a company that's based in New York City, although they have offices in other parts of the country as well. Um, They are, I like to describe them to people who don't know as like part management consultancy, part brand, part sort of futures and strategy. So really what they do is they help companies understand the future 
whatever that means. Um, and they help them to kind of dissect the trends that are happening within culture and how those might apply to their business. And that can manifest in anything from a new ad campaign to a new brand strategy, to whole um, entire new initiatives, to things that are happening kind of within the business, for instance, their hiring and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And who do, who do they work for? I mean, what kind of company hires these kinds of futures firms? Um, you would be surprised because lots and lots of companies that you have heard of work with these companies. So they work with big pharmaceutical companies. They work with big brands like Home Depot. Um, they work with things like um, food and beverage companies. So you might talk about Hormel, for instance, is one company that I was in a, um, a strategy session with. Um, they work with um, like Heineken beverage companies. They work with a lot of cannabis companies. <laughs> they work yeah. with, they work kind of across a bunch of different sectors. Um, and the thing I think is interesting is that, you know, people who are not aware of this kind of trend forecasting or futures advisement um, might not realize that companies could use traditional market research and also use companies like this. So it's not an yeah. either or for many businesses. So, I mean, you, you, you really interesting. I mean, there, obviously there's like, strategy consulting firms like McKinsey being maybe the most famous one. Then there is also a lot of consultees that are consultancy and advertising firms that are very focused on brand and brand creation. How do these like futures firms kind of differ, differentiate themselves from them? What do they do that's different than those kinds of firms? Well, um, I would probably answer that question differently a couple of years ago than I answer hmm. it now. Um, what I would have said a couple of years ago is that the place, the sort of niche these companies fill is that they're very future forward and they're future mm -hmm. forward in a way that means that they take the future as kind of um, 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 a, a space of inquiry, but also like a method, really. And yeah. the way that they're looking at, you know, they're not looking at next quarter or two quarters, right? Or five, even five quarters, right? They're looking at more kind of long-term issues. And they're looking at that stuff at the level of culture, by which I mean, they're interested not just in what's happening in a particular sector, but what's happening across the board in the country or the world that might impact a business. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to answer the question now, I think a lot of the companies that used to not be as focused on futures as a method are much more into it now, yeah. into it rhetorically and into it methodologically. So Deloitte has a futures um, wing, McKinsey has a futures wing, BCG, Boston Consultant Group has a futures wing. And they used, they, they have had these for a while. When I was even doing my research, they had them, but they're so much more prominent now. Yeah. Um, and you also are seeing traditional advertising agencies really lean into talk about futures and innovation. I know you know this as well, right? Um, so I think there's a lot more of a muddled space now than there was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to, just to support what you're saying, it's because these other longer, you know, these older firms, these firms that were not doing futures have gotten into the futures world, right? It's become a very hot thing in a, in a, a lot of regards. Yeah. I mean, I'm very fond of saying the future is a trend, right? Yeah. By which like everybody wants to be doing futures. Everybody wants to be using that language. And yeah. it's so interesting to me because I feel like, I mean, I, I sort of watched it happen because I became interested in it and started to notice it more, but it yeah. also just increased in volume so much over since totally. you know I started working on this stuff in 2015. And now it's mm -hmm. like, in 2015, people didn't know what I was talking about. And now everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. So I mean, one thing we maybe we should get on the table, just a definitional thing is, um, you know, like what a trend is in your understanding. One thing I like about the book is you go way back, you know, like, to the early 20th century and even before that to think about what, you know, what what trends are and how we've understood them differently. But what is a trend in your way of looking at things? Yeah, so I think a trend is a movement in culture that happens over time and space that shows a social trajectory, by which I mean people influencing other people to do stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And what that also means is that some people are doing something and other people will be doing it in the future. 
Um, so I like that definition because I think it applies to everything like TikTok trends, right? Things that might only yeah. be around for a day or two. And it applies to really long term trends like the trend in people having fewer children, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things are about social influence. All of those things are about movement and change and attitudes and behaviors. And all of them kind of migrate across populations from one group to another. That's interesting. And is there something, you know, is there something when we think about maybe short, shorter term trends, because I think we can talk about long term trends and changes, I don't know, maybe differently. But is there something particularly modern about trends? So like I was thinking when I was reading your book, uh, there's a historian at MIT, Roz Williams, I really like. And in an essay she wrote in the early 80s, she talked about like the poncho in Peru, the dhoti in India, the long shirt in China and the Komodo in Japan each of which were worn for like hundreds of years. Like they were pretty static in form in a, in a lot of ways. So I wonder if like a lot of times when we're talking about trends, are we talking more about modern culture and mass production and kind of consumer goods and stuff like that? Is that like a big focus here? Yeah. So I think, you know, that's this is one of those things where it's like if you want to get into a debate with somebody who's going to bring yeah. up, you know, like the tulip craze of 16, right, whatever, right, yeah, like yeah. that, you know, you could have that conversation. Uh, but I think that, you know, I do think that it's a modern phenomenon. And I do think that the trends that I'm interested in are connected to the rise of consumer culture. Mm -hmm. And they're connected not just into sort of like diffusion of behavior or innovation, but they're really connected to um, what happens when capitalism gets into the mix and when there's yeah. a market for selling change. That's the part of it that I'm really interested in. Right. That's that that, that makes a lot of sense. So um you wrote an earlier book called Writing the Record, The Village Voice and the Birth of Rock Criticism, which I definitely want to read. How would you go from rock criticism to this? What What's the path for, between those things? OK, well, let me tell you, when I was in high school, I know I'm just kidding. I'm not going <laughs> to not going to talk about high school. I promise I'm not going to talk about high school. Um so I was very interested in music critic criticism. I was a music critic before I went to grad school. And my first okay. my first book was about um, I mean, my first book was based on my dissertation. So when I was doing music criticism and thinking about music criticism sort of intellectually and historically, I got very interested in it because of um the sort of role of music critics as cultural intermediaries. Yeah. So really interested in them, not um, as sort of intellectuals, as people who help culture to move through the world um, and as kind of that space between production and consumption. That's how I kind of thought about it. So um, I was writing about that. And I think that first the connection between like trend forecasters and sort of cultural strategists and um, music critics is that, right? They kind of operate yeah. at the same level of culture. But when I was writing about music, I also got very interested in the promotional capacity of criticism and mm -hmm. how critics could kind of set things in motion or they could stall things um, or, you know, uh, prevent them from moving around completely or being popular completely. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's that famous story of Robert Criscow, like basically getting the band cream to break up because he wrote such a scathing review of them, which is folklore, mm -hmm. but you know, there's, it's rooted right. in some truth. So I got very interested from there in like the idea of hype mm -hmm. and how, um, you know, how criticism and other sort of, um, discourses helped to pr promote and circulate certain kinds of culture. So as I was thinking about hype, I started thinking about trends and I was mm -hmm. like, huh, I wonder if hype and trends are similar, you know, let me see what I can find about trends. And that's kind of how I fell into talking about trend forecasting and learning about it. Even I found yeah. Faith Popcorn's 1991 book, um, the popcorn report. And I was like, holy crap, <laughs> this is a gold mine. And then yeah. I was like, OK, now I have to write about this. Now I write about futurists. I think if you bump into a character with a name like Faith Popcorn and you don't write about that person, you're you're missing out in life. So. Yeah, she is amazing in so many ways and so interesting. And I just, you know, her for people who do not know her story, she's like someone to pull out of the history books and just take a look at because it's just a remarkable phenomenon that she became so famous for basically just, you know, pred predicting supposedly where culture was going to go. Mm hmm. 
Can I ask just as an aside, what kind of music did you write criticism about when you were a critic? Um, you know, again, when I was in high school. Now, this is like, <laughs> it's so funny to me because I, um, when I started writing about music, I was writing online. And yeah. I started doing it in the year, around the year 2000, which right now I know, you know, that was like, I was writing in a moment, right? I yep. was like part of a, part of a, of a zeitgeist of people who were starting to write music criticism and do other kinds of writing on the web at a time when people didn't understand at all what writing on the web was. Mm -hmm. So because people didn't understand what it was, I could literally call up Universal and be like, hey, can I get tickets to see like you know, to see Madonna and people would be like, sure, you know, you're writing wow. about it on the internet. What's that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I used to work for a website called Pop Matters, which started okay. around the same time as Pitchfork. And it was yeah. kind of a general interest um, all over the place from indie rock to pop to, you know, Brit pop to electronic. And I kind of wrote about anything that I liked. So a lot right. of Brit pop, a lot of early you know, like Liars and the Decembrists, a lot of the New York bands that were coming up at that time. Um, yeah, just it's like a whole other right life. But yeah, we will not talk about high school, but Britpop was my my main thing back then. So um, we can talk about that some other time. Okay. There's whole, whole <laughs> lands to discuss. OK, yeah. So what, what did the research? Um, you know, I like to humanize academic research uh for for listeners what it what did you do for this book what 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 was, what'd you get up to to do the research for this book um so a big part of it was talking to people so yeah. you know i would keep a big piece of butcher block paper on my office wall and anytime i found somebody who i thought maybe sort of worked on what i was interested in i would write their name down and i would sort of google stock them and linkedin stock them and try to find them um, so I talked to, uh, about 75, I think it's 72, uh, trend forecasters and futurists. Mm -hmm. Um, they were located, a lot of them were in the U S um, a lot of them were in New York city, which, so I was traveling to New York back and forth pretty much every two weeks for a long mm -hmm. period of time. Um, I also did a big trip to the Netherlands because there's a huge futures industry in the Netherlands, yeah. huge trends industry. So um, I did about 10 days in Amsterdam and just traveled around and talked to, I think, 30 people in those 10 days, 25 people. Um, so that was a big part of it was just finding people and talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, I went to some archives. So um, there were the archives. I did the the Hoover Institute archives at Stanford mm -hmm. to try to find the papers for the recent social trends, um, yeah. which are stored there. Um, recent social trends being a um, a big study that was con commissioned by Herbert Hoover in 1929 to study um, sort of trends that were happening in society. Um, I went to Columbia, which has the to Alvin Toffler archives which at the time were sealed. I was one of yeah. the first people to go and look at them. So that's pretty amazing to do. Yeah. Um, I went to the Baker Library at Harvard, which um, had a couple of useful sort of business archives. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just like collected stuff, bought random things on eBay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> a lot of that, uh, old cool. books and things, yeah. Nice. Um, where did the trend forecasting industry come from? I mean, you kind of trace several threads, but when you think about the trend forecasting industry as a thing, where do you see its roots laying? Um, I really start with Faith Popcorn. Um, mm -hmm. And Faith Popcorn was a woman, she's still alive, but um, at the time she was working, she was working in advertising in the, um, in the 60s and in the early 1970s kind of struck out on her own path um, with a partner, I should say, um, and uh, whose name is Stuart Pittman. So Popcorn and Pittman started this company and the goal of their company was really, I guess what we would call now strategy. But at mm -hmm. the time they were like, we help companies figure out what they should do next. Mm -hmm. um, so they started doing that advisement. Um, Faith Popcorn was very influenced by Alvin Toffler's Future Shock, which came out in 1970. She started her company in 1974. Um, and it was kind of happening amid a lot of other things that were happening on that front, right? Like 
um, different forms of prediction, um, rise of computers mm -hmm. uh, used for, um, for prediction purposes, um, and just different kind of applied futurism, right, or applied yeah. futurology. So um, a lot of people who were either inspired by Toffler or were sort of his contemporaries were starting to, like, figure out the business application. So I really time it to kind of like a, an early, you know, 70 to 75 kind of moment. Yeah. And one thing you really nicely highlight, and, you know, we know in a broader historical sense, is that the 70s were a tough period for American business. So there was like, if for people, you know, there was probably a big market at that moment for like, please do tell me about the future because it's been so hard and uncertain recently. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels between the 70s and now, you know, mm -hmm. I think you have a whole bunch of companies that are looking at a younger generation that is demanding a lot of change. And they're kind of like, uh oh, we don't know what to do with this. And that's yeah. happening at the same time that people are starting to become aware of environmental issues of different, there's, you know, all kinds of political turmoil and strife. There was a big war that the U S was getting out of. Like there are so many parallels. And I think mm -hmm. at those moments of really intense social pressure, people start to think about the future differently and they start mm -hmm. to think more strategically about the future and they start to worry if the future is even going to be a thing. Right. Yeah. So I think some of, of that some of what you know what future trend forecasting grew out of is that concern that like the future may not be something that we can control so let's see what we can do and kind of get our hands around it our minds mm -hmm. around it i i really liked your chapter on the rise of cool hunting and cool hunters so tell us a bit about that who are the who are the cool hunters and how did that start I mean, you and I are the cool hunters. <laughs> <That's>... Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> I'm like the most middle-aged person that exists, right? I'm definitely not a cool hunter. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I love the cool hunting story because it's connected to things that I remember as an undergrad reading mm -hmm. and movies I remember seeing and stuff. So, um Cool hunter, cool hunting was basically a moment that happened in the late 90s and the early 2000s, where companies started to be very interested in young people. And by young people, I mean millennials before they were called millennials. Mm. So they start to get really interested in this new, huge teenage demographic and what they're doing and how they're thinking and whether they'll be allegiant, uh, allegiance to, that, is that a word? <laughs> whether they'll have allegiance to their brands. Yeah. And, um, they say, well, you know what? The best way to go about doing this would be to try to get some insight from actual young people. And at that same time, there are a couple of sort of entrepreneurial um, 20 somethings uh, who start doing basically corporate anthropology for these companies, co mm -hmm. anthropology around young people for these companies. So helping them to spot trends, helping them to find out what young people like. So it's kind of this form of market research, but it's very... Um, qualitative it's very grassroots and it's very kind of interested in new tech so they're using yeah. portable video cameras and stuff like that and going to raves and <laughs> you know it's yeah, all yeah, kind yeah. of kind of amazing so yeah yeah and some of this stuff like ends up in like well-known publications like gladwell's tipping point and stuff like that right i mean we see it flash out into kind of broader culture too yeah you know there's a lot of ways in which uh, malcolm gladwell kind of created cool hunting huh. um and he created it by virtue of publicizing it in a way and crystallizing um he you know he sort of crystallized what was a real dynamic and amplified it in a way that made it larger than life which is yeah. what Malcolm Gladwell is good at doing right um, <laughs> and then but yeah. when he when he amplified it even more companies responded to it mm -hmm. so in that sense he was kind of you know i i, I hate the term thought leader um, yeah. for lots of different reasons but he really was that in that moment you know yeah um, well, I mean, that I mean, what you just said about Gladwell is really interesting and I think gets at a number of kind of like a d big theme and deep theme in the book, because there's a couple of different ways I want to ask you about it. I mean, so first of all, what are the methods of kind of trend forecasting and are they methods like that we should put a lot of faith in when it comes to like prediction, for instance, you know, are they predicting the future? 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I got a lot of questions from people about the sort of prediction prescription, right? Are they predicting yeah. the future? Are they sort of, you know, is the tail wagging the dog kind of thing? Um, and my answer to that is usually like, yes, 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 right? Yes uh-huh. on both sides. Um, I really genuinely believe after doing research on this book that people who are very well connected, who, who know a lot of what's going on in business, who read a lot of publications, who sort of have their ear to the ground, I think those people are good at knowing what people will want next. Now, whether mm-hmm. that is the same thing as being able to predict what's going to happen in 2050, I don't think so exactly. But mm-hmm. I do think that there is something to something methodological to paying attention to the dynamics of culture, sort of using your other kinds of knowledge, whether that's sociological, political, demographic, etc., and combining those things together and coming up with a prediction. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that there's something to that. Now, does everybody who say it says they can predict the future do it well? Absolutely not. Right. Mm-hmm. Does everybody use robust methods? No way. You know, yeah. and does everybody have, you know, so it's like it's a skill. Not everybody's equally good at it. And it's also not something, you know, if somebody is predicting it, it, it there's a difference between predicting that like high top sneakers are going to come back in fashion and predicting that like, you know, there's going to be a backlash to having fewer children and suddenly people are going to have six children, right? Like right. those are very, very different kinds of predictions. Yeah. And I find sometimes people muddle those two things, right? You might be yeah. really good at sneakers and really bad at, you know, <laughs> a family right. composition. Demographics. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. The the other way, I mean, I think there's there's been a shift in, I, I work in, around people who are kind of do the STS and uh, history of like economic thinking. And there's been this kind of pragmatist turn around the history of economic thinking, which might be summarized that like economic thought is an engine, not a camera. And the, mm-hmm. the idea there is like, scholars realize that economic thought is not just like some kind of objective, neutral picture of the economy that these ideas actually end up like influencing the the economy, right? That they, they become like engines in the economy. So, I mean, the way I kept seeing it play out in your book is, is that like, they're not just predicting trends. In a lot of ways, they're like producing trends, right? Like, just as you said with, with Gladwell, when he writes about it in a certain way and amplifies it, it's not just like he just sees something, he's also making it, right? So, I mean, do you think that, plays out with your folks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is the that's the truly powerful thing, whether you think it's for good or ill yeah. about these kind of methods, right? Which is at bottom, they are narratives. They are stories about what's happening in culture. And I don't want to say that the stories that are happening in culture are infinite, but they are multiple and they yeah. are far broader than the ones that are dominant at any given moment. They're far more um multiple than what we might see in the news, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what futurists and what trend forecasters are really good at doing is finding compelling ways to tell stories out of cultural information and Mm -hmm. use those stories in persuasive ways that affect the actions of the clients that they advise. So people make decisions based on the narratives that are put forward by uh, trend forecasters. Yeah. And like going back to your your point about rock critics and like cultural intermediaries, as you call these folks, like one reason we should be interested in these people, even if we don't think they actually are very good at predictive whatever they have predictive powers, is that they're culturally influential. Right. I mean, these people are having an impact on business in any number of ways. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and something that people often ask me is like, well, you know, if Faith Popcorn predicted that there would be robots on the street that would give us hugs um, and there aren't, like, isn't she wrong? And like, shouldn't we sort of point our finger at and laugh and say, isn't she wrong? And I was like, you know, the point is not that she's wrong. Like, it doesn't actually, ma- I don't want to say it doesn't matter at all, but it d- mostly does not matter whether the predictions are right or wrong. Um, what matters is that they affect action. What matters yeah. is that they are inspiring. And what matters is that they start to mobilize how people might might imagine and might come to 
act in the future. So even if they're not exactly right, they've already kind of done the work that they needed to do. Yeah. And it's sort of a fool's errand, I think. It always actually annoys me when people look back and are like, that prediction was wrong. Ha ha ha. And it's like, it doesn't matter if people spent like seven mil- seventy million dollars trying to do something around it and it came out a different way, right? That money, those resources, that that certitude has already like been, it's already been spent, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Do you, have you ever bumped into this guy, Neil Pollock's work? Do you know him? Yeah, I do know his work. I'm not intimately familiar with it, but I yeah. do know it. Yeah. But I mean, I like he, he he has a similar kind of story about these kind of industry analysts who look at, I mean, they're looking at uh, technology in a way that you're not. Like p- p- people who are like these cultural intermediaries around what system to buy next, you know? And it's something very similar there. I mean, these people get predictions wrong all the time. But the point is like, they have huge influence on like what people are buying and stuff. You know, they're shaping where the capital goes. And like, I think that's that's kind of important on its own. Yeah. And I think in many respects there, you know, the people that I looked at are shaping the conversation because yep. they're shaping the questions that people ask. They're shaping the priorities that people set. Right. And so there's this, there are these ripple effects around that. Um I don't know if you want to go in this t- this direction, but it's been very interesting to me to watch what has happened to some of the companies that I studied before the pandemic, during the yeah. pandemic. Because, well, yeah, like, yeah. please do talk about that because that wouldn't be in your book. So like, yeah, let's, let's hear about that. Yeah, what's been super fascinating um, is that when the pandemic started, none of the companies were had predicted it coming right which is like on the one hand you would say okay they don't actually like point to and say you know in six months this discrete event is going to happen that's kind of not what they're in the business of so on the one hand you say you don't expect them to have predicted it on the other hand you know there were companies who were um and particular people that i know who are working who who were saying things like we're in a post-pandemic landscape they were saying things and suggesting that the direction the world was going was one in which like um you know the realities of the pandemic did not fit at all. So in that sense, they missed it completely. They never considered that that could disrupt travel, for instance. It could disrupt, um, you know, congregating in place. Like none of those things were, or like the whole idea of wellness, right? That wellness Mm -hmm. was focused on this sort of like loosey-goosey, like I want to put cucumbers on my (laughs) eyes as opposed to like actual healthcare, right? So in that sense, they were like, they all completely missed the mark. And it has been absolutely fascinating to watch them number one turn a 180 and 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 embrace the pandemic and all that it has come to represent and number two use it as a business growth opportunity so this is why i say again it doesn't matter if you're wrong what many companies are looking for are affirmation right they're looking for inspiration they're looking for ideas and they don't have any right (laughs) right (laughs) you know they're looking for somebody to say yeah, that's fine. You're right. Your instincts are right, right? They're looking yeah. for confirmation. So, um, and these companies are able to offer all of that in spades. You know, that's what they're right. really good at doing. So in the moment where so many companies were uncertain about wh- how to move forward, many of these co- these um, trend forecasters actually thrived. When you think that they would have, you know, fallen by the wayside for getting it wrong, instead they capitalized on it and their businesses are bigger now than they used to be. That's fascinating. Yeah, and by the way, there were people predicting these kind of pandemics, as Adam Tooze, the historian, has been writing about recently. So, yeah, I mean, some people, some people had it right, but maybe it didn't end up in the industry. And I totally support. I mean, go. People should go check out Faith Popcorn's uh, webpage. There's all kinds of pandemic stuff on there, you know. And yeah. I, I like. And I looked at a couple of the other companies. They're all about like post-pandemic futures yeah, now. They're like, all that's like- the. It's pandemic, equity, sustainability, right? Yes. That's kind of like the trifecta. And yeah. all of that is because, you know, that's why it's, yeah. I find it so fascinating that like visions of the future are always embedded in the now, even yeah. for futurists, even for people who are in the business of trying to shake away the biases of the now, they're still completely colored by those. So yeah. of course they would be talking about diversity and equity and inclusion now. Of course they would be. Because yeah. they live in would, the world that we do, you know? <laughs> I, I would love to see how much their equity message changed, like, post-Black Lives Matter summer, too, right? Like, the 
the shift or me too or whatever. I mean, I, the point is that these kind of shifts happen at a deeper level in our culture and then they end up in our thinking a lot of times, I think. Yeah. I mean, what I, I what I would say to that is that most companies were were interested in diversity and, mm -hmm. and equity and inclusion. They were interested in feminism. They were sort of like on the peripheries of these movements and real, you know, and champions of their kind of more, um, what should I say, uh, maybe cosmetic manifestations. Like, yeah. for instance, a makeup company that has a literal cosmetic, the makeup company yeah, that yeah. has multiple shades, very invested in that. And what you see now is that they're just a lot more uh, progressive and a lot more um, vocal about structural issues. Oh, interesting. Um, that's yep. kind of the change. Mm -hmm. um, so in the... Um in the second part of your book, uh, among other things, you kind of zoom out to kind of like a more global stage. So how how does this how does trend, uh, you know, forecasting change when we start considering like the planet? Right. Because like when a lot of times, like when I think of Gladwell and trends, it's like what the cool kids in Manhattan are doing and how that might spread to the suburbs. But when you pull out and start thinking about kind of multiple communities and the whole globe. The picture gets much more complex. So what does it look like there? Yeah, so I would, uh, I guess I would, I would begin by saying that um, the globe is not the globe, by, mm. by which I mean, you know, many of the companies that I looked at are sort of, they pay lip service, lip service to globalization. They were kind of like cosmopolitanly global in that yeah. way that, you know, the pandemic really shut down, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, very interested in kind of like the sort of hot metropolises of the mostly global north and a few in the global south. Um, and so when you take that version of the globe, what you're really looking for is, you know, I have a company in London and how can I find this thing that's happening in South Africa that might yep. be marketable to my company in London, right? right. It was a very sort of neo-colonial perspective on futures and in terms of yeah. finding interesting developments um, outside of the global north and then kind of siphoning them in. And that was true, you know, that um, relationship between the sort of center and the periphery was true everywhere. It's true in the U.S. as well. Yeah. Right? And that... Um, so, so I guess that's the the first way I would think about like what it meant to be global. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, there are future and trends companies um, in many different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of thinking about the future that aren't dominated by a sort of Western, uh, white, kind of linear kind of futures that dominates this industry. Yeah. And, um, and there are organizations that are kind of trying to be global in a different way and kind of sort of talking to more of these kind of diverse versions of thinking about the future. But um, yeah, yeah, so 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 yeah, I guess there's kind of two two sides to it. Yeah, I want to talk more about the second side a little bit later. But I, well, just think about that first part about kind of global markets and mostly Western, though not all Western firms. I mean, is this really about kind of the emergence of kind of global middle classes and who can buy consumer goods and looking for the next place where that you're going to get that growth and that bump where, you know, people have expendable cash they can afford to buy watches and shoes or whatever. Yeah, I do. I do think it's connected to the growth of the global middle class. But I also think it's about like capitalizing on what's marketable about other parts of the world and bringing those mm -hmm. all into the already developed countries, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about a place like China, I think there's both, right? There's both this idea that there's this tremendous market power in China that companies want to tap into. And there's this also this, this kind of like exotification of China and this yeah. idea that there are certain pieces of that that could, that might be, that might go over really well in Munich or, you know, right, right, in right. Antwerp or whatever yeah you know when you talk about yoga for a long time and sure. these kinds of like <laughs> yeah sure. yeah yeah um you know you write about how the trend industry has really struggled with inclusion especially racial inclusion why do you why do you think that is um you know that's a good question and it's one of the things that i think has really started to change in the wake of george floyd when i said that you know their focus is more structural i think that's an yeah. internal focus as well but um you know, I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, this is an this is a kind of industry that a lot of people don't 
know about, right? You can't major in call in undergrad in futures or trend forecasting at most places, yeah. right? Um, and so in that sense, it tends to gravitate, to, uh, people who fall into this industry tend to be people who maybe they went into fashion, maybe they went into journalism, maybe they sort of tooled around New York for a while, kicking, kicking things around, and they kind of fell into that industry. So I think it, I think in that sense, if, we, if we're talking structurally, it already has a real class bias, mm-hmm. you know, and like a college yes. educated kind of middle middle to upper middle class person who has the luxury to kind of wander about and find a career that's a kind of tra- a non-traditional career path. Mm-hmm. Um, although obviously there are exceptions and individuals sure. have different um, different issues going on. Um, so I think that that's part of it. Um, I think that the other part of it, you know, I think part of it is also about the the priorities of the industry in terms of the populations that they serve. Mm-hmm. And, um, and when I say the populations that they serve, I mean, like, you know, if they're working in the, in the same way that advertising is working for clients, yeah. that um, these companies are working for clients and they're working for clients that are often really focused on white middle class consumers that are yeah. often really focused on a certain um, people who make above a certain amount of money or who are located in certain, um, you know, urban centers, right? So I think there's a real bias towards that and Mm -hmm. that the people who are able to feel really comfortable in those meetings and really comfortable in that space, you know, they tend to be, um, you know, they tend to sort of be of that demographic as well. Um, Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's, you know, I don't think that that's the entire picture. Um, I did see some companies, you know, Sparks and Honey is a good example of a company that did have... um, you know, it wasn't an all white staff um, and they did hire a lot of young people of color at that company. They hired a lot hmm. of queer people, et cetera. And, and I would say they probably have more now than they did then. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the companies that were kind of more coming out of the foresight and the sort of traditional futurology, right. which has always been super white male dominated, yes. those companies tended to be oh, um, man. much whiter. Yeah. The foresight, when I think of that industry, I think of white guys standing on a big stage, like doing a TED talk. I don't know why that's the image of my, in my head, but it is. Yeah. I think of like people who want to talk to like the military (laughs) or who want to send people into space. Right. Yeah. Um, That's what I think of. Yeah. So, so in that chapter, uh, one of the chapters I'm thinking of where you deal with this inclusion issue, you talk about Afrofuturism. So like, how does this, that topic kind of come in? Um, to this for you. Yeah, so that's another thing that I think has changed. Um, Mm -hmm. Just to give an example, Sparks and Honey did a whole... Um, a briefing on Afrofuturism. You hmm. would have not, like, I did not see anything like that. Um, you know, if they, if any of the companies mentioned Afrofuturism before the pandemic, it was like, look at this cool African Afrofuturist designer who makes oh, like no. really sexy skirts, oh, right? It was like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, not thinking of Afrofuturism as a method or as a paradigm for talking about the future. Um, yeah. So what I would say is Afrofuturism means a lot of different things to different people, but but the way that I think about it is a very um, it is a it's a way of thinking about the future that prioritizes blackness and prioritizes the black experience and the persistence of blackness into the beyond. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And by virtue of doing that, it sort of upends the idea that futures do not contend with the past. Right. So the future is necessarily connected to the struggle over racism and slavery and all of the legacies that continue to inform how black people experience their lives. Right. Um, it doesn't. So there is so there's not this sense that we will progress into the future and race will be a fiction or race. I mean, race is already a fiction, but race will be, you know, erased because we'll get to a point where we're all just these, you know, beautiful, multiracial, whatever people, right? right? The idea is instead that like, no, when we move into the future, we have to continue, we continue to carry our bodies and our histories with us. And that continues to inform what the future looks like. Mm-hmm. And I do think that some of the companies are starting to think about that a little bit more, you know, hmm. they're starting to think about um, structural legacies a little bit more, um, in large part because of George Floyd. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wanted to kind of 
go, I mean, you kind of perfectly set up the next question, which is, at you know, at the end of the book, you call for a shift in how trends are thought about and produced. And you write, ideally, we can democratize how trends come into being and empower every one of us to actively shape rather than passively receive our collective future. So how do you imagine that working? Um, I mean, this podcast is a big part of it, right? <laughs> um, no, I, so I would, I think that one of the things that I came away from doing this research understanding is that futures is such a powerful method and it is a powerful method that everybody can use mm -hmm. um, because for a few reasons. One, I think most people, if you tell them that they have some control over their future, they would not believe you. Right. Um, but that's because they don't think about how the actions that we take today affect tomorrow. And they don't recognize that there are all kinds of people in positions of power who are taking really aggressive steps to shape yeah. tomorrow today. So I think that is just to me, that was such a revelatory and welcome gift. And I think that that is a way of thinking that should be, you know, should be in our schools, should be in our activist organizations, our community organizations. It's just extremely empowering. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is really empowering about it is this idea of telling stories and that stories are ways to persuade people about futures that might come. So mm -hmm. when we imagine the future, we don't just like, it's not just a vain exercise. It can be a literal um, sort of plotting out and, and and opening up of horizons for people so that they can imagine their the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the the optimist in me thinks that there's something to that, that we imagine the future not to feel um, hemmed in by it, but instead to feel empowered to make it happen or to change course. You know, yeah. I'm very fond of telling my students that like predictions exist not not to lock you in, but to open you up. And to say, hmm. like, I don't want that prediction. I don't want that future. I want something else to happen. What can I do so that something else happens? Yeah. And I think one thing I like about that, the, the way you write that conclusion, it's like if if there's not this kind of push for kind of democratization and, and the rest of us doing it, then we're just leading it up to a certain class, you know? I was thinking about this. So my university is foolishly building an over $1 billion innovation campus for Amazon's headquarters to uh, in Northern Virginia. And uh, Am Amazon, you know, they move in there because that's where all the defense contractors and where the DOD and NSA are, right? Yeah. And um, so at first, my university was promising innovation, economic growth. There's no evidence these things produce those things. So that was bogus. But now they, they've, just, they've released a new strategic plan and what's the what's the main line about what this uh, campus is about? It's about it's called the national imperative, and it's about keeping the United States number one when it comes to technology, oh, right? Which yeah. is code for China, <laughs> sure. right? Right. And so it's like you know, if we don't, if you know, there's not a kind of democratization about what how these things should shift, and you know what what our future should be. Then it becomes like elites, like getting us into Cold War Two, in a sense. You know, that's that's what I was thinking about when I was reading your conclusion. Yeah, and I think that you know, this is why you have to be an optimist, right? And I don't want to suggest that there's not still power, and that yeah. you know, just by virtue of learning like how to do environmental scanning as a futures method, you will upend the seats of power. I don't. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I wish, but unfortunately, no. Right. right. Um, but I do think that it's a critical step and that one of the things that like, you know, if I can speak about power in the abstract, one of the things that power is really good at doing is like establishing that certain things are inevitable. You know, you yeah. always hear tech companies saying, well, social media is not going away. Facial recognition is not going <laughs> yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. So if it's not going away, we got to do this and we got to do that. Right. And it's like, no, that's you know, we have a choice in the matter. We can steer the ship in a different direction. The pandemic has shown us that your entire plans right. can be thrown out the window, right? Climate yeah, change yeah, yeah. is showing us that plans are thrown out the window. So at that moment, it's like we need to, you know, we deserve and owe it to ourselves to embrace the possibilities of that moment. And I think that futures help you to do that. Yeah. 
So you have a couple, I heard, uh, before we, we pressed record, I heard you said you have a couple articles coming down the tubes. What do you, what have you been working on since the book and what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on a whole bunch of different things. Some of it is like detritus from the book. Um, one thing I've been trying to think about is um, the idea of trend journalism. Uh-huh. So there's this throwaway line in the book where I talk about how trend has been so deeply enmeshed into the conventions of cultural journalism, you yeah. know, so that a journalist can be like, here's three people that, you know, they live in three different cities. They all like have x and therefore this thing is happening so they're all taking mushrooms (laughs) exactly right so mushrooms it is yeah um yeah or ayahuasca or we know whatever it is so um i've been trying to understand that and understand Mm -hmm. the sort of elements of future prediction that come from journalism but -hmm. also really trying to think about it epistemologically and that Mm -hmm. is where like what does it mean to think in trends? How does it shape cultural narratives? And what does that do to all of us? Um, and, you know, yeah. I don't quite I don't quite get there in this piece, but, you know, maybe in the future, I think it has something to do with like the hot take culture and uh-huh. like the, um, you know, the, yeah, the orgy of interpretation that we kind yeah. of live in, um, where people yeah. are very ready to uh you know, to sort of connect the dots and see patterns. Um, And again, I think that that's, you know, there's, there's something that's empowering about that, but I think there's also something that is that we should caution ourselves around that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like, I really like that when you write about that, um, that how journalists do that, you focus on, you know, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, Oh God, psychedelic drugs and, you're talking about like San Francisco and New York, and then it becomes a trend, right? But it, like a lot of those journalists, they live in coastal rich cities. They're not paying it. So like people get left behind in this trend talk too, right? Yeah, the way that you see, right, the way that people see things in trends, whether we're talking about trend fast forecasters or futurists or journalists, yeah. shapes the narratives that come out and then frames understanding for a huge swath of people, mm-hmm. sometimes in ways that are recursive or sort of um, prescriptive, right? So sometimes people go, oh, people are taking psychedelics. I should take psychedelics. Right. I, here I am in St. Louis. I'm going to take psychedelics, <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, and sometimes in ways that really cut certain people out, right? Yeah. You could also, you know, I'm, I'm very fond of telling my students, like, you know, as much as we could say there's been this, you know, movement towards social justice and wokeness or whatever you want to say, yeah. like, there has also been, obviously, a, a great backlash and a conservative, you know, proto-fascist or even real fascist movement. And they're happening at the same time. Time. And right. whichever one you think is ascendant depends on what examples you choose and what story you tell. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, what else? You said you had a couple things going on. What else are you working on? Um, I've also been thinking a lot about what futures means in a world where people think there's not going to be a future. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of my next, I think, maybe book long project. I'm not cool. quite sure yet, but I'm very interested in like utopian and dystopian futures and yeah. non, in non futures. Um, and in, and also, you know, because I like I, I like thinking about this in terms of business, like what does that mean for companies, you know, and yeah. what does that mean for advisement of companies? You know, the example I always like to use is like, you know, if you work in the glitter industry, if you're in the glitter space right now, you know, and we're thinking about climate change you know does glitter need to exist like is the best future for you that you right. just cease no. operation <laughs> yes. you know? die um, right you know and you could say the same thing for fast fashion you know yeah um, for sure yeah. you know there's really not a sustainable way to do fast fashion nope you know so um i'm very interested in watching that um that dialogue develop yeah i like that so here here's a question for you about mm-hmm. this kind of future stuff have you been following? I call these people contrarian optimists. Okay. Some of them, some of them are like Pinker is an example, but he is like in with like the Breakthrough Institute and Cato. I have this book somewhere around here called like Ten Trends, you know, and it's like Ten Trends yeah. You Should Love, and it's like you know, it's about how the the world is actually getting better and better. Yeah, do you know this take? Yep. And it's mm-hmm. like, it, and so. It's interesting because they want you to be optimistic, but also they get they get accused by the left and kind of like Marxists and stuff of being like, uh, 
unjustly optimistic or something like that. So I'm wondering how those folks play in your mix. Yeah, I mean, I love that stuff. I think it's super interesting intellectually. And I think, you know, to me, what's interesting is the um, is the polarization, right? So the yeah. like uber dystopian and the uber utopian yeah and i'm kind of wondering where the pragmat where the pragmatists live you know and you could say that like you know at this point if you're thinking about climate like pragmatism is dystopianism <laughs> like this, right. that is the yeah, same yeah. thing yeah you know um so i yeah i i'm interested in it and uh, it's something i'd like to spend some more time thinking and researching as i'm kind of moving forward on this well, I will watch to, to see what you do. I think you're, you're doing really w interesting work, Devin. And um, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things like most things in this world depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Ford is the Athenaeum Coordinator and Digital Humanities Specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>